Welcome to this Creative Sensemaker Live in which we'll be looking at the changing face of cultural experience and its interaction with social media and podcasts during the pandemic and I hope having some fun along the way. I'm Matt Dancona, I'm one of the editors here at Tortoise and it's a real treat to have you all here on a Friday lunchtime. Thank you for joining us with such a terrific lineup of speakers and with thanks as ever to um, Santander our partners in this event. Um, as always, we want you to have your say. We want to hear what you um, uh, are thinking what's, and what your social media experience of culture, uh, movies, cinema, um, whatever it might be, has been in the last 11 months and what you're hoping for, I guess, just as importantly in the months ahead as we look forward to um, a, a, a cautious but irreversible uh, relaxation as the Prime Minister has promised. Uh, my colleague Tom Goulding will be at the helm in the chat so um, inundate him with thoughts and do please chip in with any ideas and, and visions of, of great cultural experiences to come that you have. So I think I mean it, for me it's been amazing with cultural venues mostly closed um, during the last 11 months to see just how innovative people have been with um, Twitter get-togethers and podcasts to enable their viewers and listeners to, or do, to enable viewers and listeners to enjoy stream content or um, other, other things, albums um, together and, 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 and simultaneously, um, even though they've been physically apart, they have they found a new way of, of, of being together, which is, which is uh, really something remarkable um, and, and has been a kind of one of the joys of um, of lockdown. Um, so here to steer us in the right direction. Um, I think I'm not sure if he's joined us yet, but he's coming is uh, Max Alexander, who's CEO of Secret Cinema, which I was astonished to learn today. It's been going since 2007, which really ages me. And uh, I think it's one of the most genuinely creative innovations in the UK, uh, as far as culture goes, of the last uh, two decades. Emily Cook, um, who as well as being assistant editor of Doctor Who magazine, a, a, a job title I aspire to one day, and a magazine I can heartily recommend, um, has been very uh, uh, entrepreneurially producing Doctor Who lockdown uh, during the pandemic, of which much more soon. And Tom Bannum, digital editor of Squire, um, uh, which has been hosting watch-alongs of great movies uh, during lockdown, with stars and directors such as Pierce Brosnan on GoldenEye and Bruce Robinson, uh, the director of The Great and endlessly rewatchable With Noel and I. Uh, so let's not uh, waste any more time on, on, on my preamble and get dive straight into this fascinating subject. And, and let me start, if I may, with Emily. Um, can you tell us, um, Emily, where the idea for Doctor Who Lockdown came from? Um, and how how it works, just in terms of you know getting people to understand how to how to um, how to do this because it you, you know we're all used to the the, the sort of um, uh, convenience of watching um, episodes of the program or or any other stream content when we want, but the idea of doing it simultaneously that was a new one. So mm. did you expect it to be a success? Yes and no. I think it. I, I think I knew that it had potential very early on, but didn't necessarily expect it to become quite as big as it did. Um, so the idea came, um, it was mid-March, so almost a year ago now, when we started to sense that things were getting a bit strange and we knew that a lockdown was imminent. And I am a big Doctor Who fan and I often watch Doctor Who in times of trouble to pick myself up. Um, and I just wondered if there was anyone else who was perhaps on their own and they were already isolating um, because of COVID that wanted to watch at the same time with me. So I picked I picked an episode that I knew lots of people um, enjoyed and I just posted out a tweet suggesting a date and a time that we get together and watch it. And um, I'm cautious of using this word in, in the climate, but it went viral. Viral. The, the tweet just got a lot of interest and a lot of traction and people were really excited about the idea of 
watching these old this old episode of Doctor Who together and I think the reason it was so exciting for people wasn't just because we were at a very scary moment in history in terms of all having to stay shut in our homes in a very isolated way but we've become so individualistic in our viewing habits and the idea because because of streaming effectively we can watch whatever we want when we watch whenever we want on our own a lot of the time and the idea of of being able to watch something at the same time together I think was quite novel for some people not all fans um so I just yeah posted out the tweet suggesting that we watch it on this day at this time um and very simply everyone finds their own way to watch and the episode is thankfully very accessible and we all just press play at the same time and it was a relatively easy concept for people to grasp and yeah that was it we, we did our first tweet along um late march last year and it trended number one in the world <laughs> um and it was at that point that i thought okay this is definitely something. something yeah i'm onto something here and and also it wasn't just the fans that had joined in but stephen moffat who wrote the episode that we watched the day of the doctor um he oh. also joined Twitter and took part. So it was this extra level of not only were the fans coming together, but they were connecting with the show's writer. And he was posting out live commentary as we were watching. And it was just really unifying. And from there, it just became bigger and bigger and bigger. And more stars of the show got involved. We've had David Tennant, Matt Smith, Catherine Tate, Bill Nye even did one, which was crazy Neil Gaiman Richard Curtis Russell T Davies all just getting involved in their episodes when we watched along um and it, yeah it just became this massive thing but it was a format that I very quickly realized does work and can can work and can kind of be applied to many different and beyond Doctor Who I mean it's something that could work beyond Doctor Who but that was obviously my my niche what was the uh, how did for those who haven't seen dare the doctor can you explain why you uh, chose that episode i chose that episode because it's so uplifting it's the 50th anniversary special of doctor who from 2013 and it had i, I was kind of thinking there's this big global pandemic and we are relying on medical support for this and um, I just kind of feel like we need a, a fictional doctor to help us just to kind of stay distracted and to stay uplifted and the day of the doctor has two doctors in it it's a multi-doctor story and it's just so uplifting and unifying and I was also thinking back to the fact that when it was on in 2013 it was um, it was simulcast around the world. There were so many countries that that were showing that episode in cinemas. And I just thought if we can recapture something of that and bring people together, then that would be great. And, and it did. There were people right across the world, so many countries taking part in different time zones, some waking up at 3 a.m. to join in. Um, and yeah, and then when it was trending number one in the world, I realised just how many people <laughs> were joining in with it. And what sort of things were people, I mean, other than, as it were, the, the, the very technical uh, de plot details and so on, which I'm sure people got, got uh, deeply immersed in, what did you find in terms of the emotions that were being aroused and feelings people were having, what, what was, what was the, the kind of feedback like that you were getting from this? Honestly, the feedback has been overwhelming. Um, the number of people that have got in touch with me to say that it has really saved their mental health, just having something to do and to put in your diary almost as, as silly as it might sound it was a regular fixture in people's weeks they knew at this time on this day they were going to come together with people around the world and it has been quite overwhelming to hear just how people have been helped by it and obviously there is an element of it is fun to just revisit these stories of Doctor Who that we love, but I think there's something even more powerful than that. And I love the show for many reasons, but I think it is a very good show for giving people hope and bringing people together in times of trouble. That is effectively what happens every episode of The Doctor. Um, and people were really feeling that sense of, okay, I'm on my own in this flat in 
Paris or London or wherever they might be. But I know that I'm coming together with fans around the world to watch. And and that is just helping me right now. Uh, so, yeah, the feedback has been overwhelming. And people have been able to appreciate the episodes on a new level. So not only are we re-watching, but we're getting new insights from the show's creators, which otherwise I don't think would have ever happened without lockdown. Um, and we were making extra content as well, brand new list with Doctor Who minisodes to go out with the tweet alongs. Um, and again, that was pulling in all sorts of people from the show, um, or the show's past, I should say. And again, I don't think that we would have been able to get David Tennant to do a little cameo in something were it not for lockdown or, or to get um, Neil Gaiman to write something were it not for lockdown. Um, so that's been an extra layer to it for fans as well. And it showed, I guess, that, you know, it's so much, so often one hears that the, the appointment television is dead, you know, the idea that everyone watches things at the same time is dead and that uh, people don't particularly have the urge any longer to congregate in the same place or, or do things at the same time. But actually there is this strong sort of human yearning, isn't there, to, to, to yeah. experience things, um, even if they are physically in different places, at the same time yeah definitely I think there's there is always going to be a place for physical interaction you know people spending like time with a, a person in the real world in a real place I don't think that that online and social media is ever going to completely make that redundant however there are people that I've interacted with and worked with and met through Doctor Who Lockdown and the Tweet Alongs online that I would never ever have made contact with otherwise and so that is a wonderful thing and I think does need to be nurtured and something that we can really really use for a force of good because I'm very much I, I love social media um I'm very much a believer that when it's used as a force for good, it is incredible. Um, I'm also aware that it has negatives and, and downsides as well, but I just think we should be doing more of these sorts of things that just celebrate the way in which social media pulls people together at a time when we really have been so far apart and, and just get the wave of good that it can do. The other thing that the tweet alongs um, and the extra content we created did was to um, generate some fundraising because I was really conscious of how much people were relying on entertainment and television um, during the pandemic just for the, the safety of their mental health, I suppose. So we were raising money for the film and TV charity as well as a kind of side thing um, and we raised thousands of pounds for them which I'm so proud of because I think it it certainly was highlighting to me during lockdown we we rely on this entertainment industry um, and they they need help and support and they're obviously going through a really really tough time thankfully productions are getting up and running again but that's another kind of force for good that that social media did you know being able to share fundraising links and stuff like that Absolutely. Well, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll come. Thank you so much. And we will come back to you uh, later in the thinking. Um, Tom, can I uh, turn to you and, 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 and ask you, you know, about the, the Esquire watch alongs? Um, you know, what was, the, what, what was the inception of those of that idea? And, and you know, were you surprised um, by the appetite for this, you know, strange hybrid where people were doing something, watching something, enjoying something collectively, but together? Um, I mean, I think for some of the Emily, really, <clears throat> one of the, I mean, we're essentially described as a celebrity magazine. Uh, we talk to and interview celebrities about films all the time. It's our kind of bread and butter. And suddenly there was nothing being released. There was nothing being made. There was no way to kind of communicate with these people that our audience sort of expect us to be chatting to. And so it felt like a really good way of just creating something where we could, I mean, kind of communicate both with our audience and with these people that they love. Um, the idea for us, I mean, it basically started out as, I think someone's already made this point, it's kind of DVD commentary where you have someone speaking over something that people are familiar with. Um, I personally can't stand people talking over films when I'm trying to watch them. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's kind of deeply frustrating. And so there's a difference between, I think, kind of having, I've, I've tried doing watch alongs with friends and stuff before. And I'm just, I just, I get to a point where I'm trying to just tune them out uh, and watch the thing that I want to watch because I find it, it, it's kind of distracting. Very different where Piers Brosnan is telling you about how they shot the tank scene in Goldeneye. And there's like, I think that's the thing that differentiates it for us. It's kind of, 
it's someone that has inherently got an insight into something that you could never get anywhere else, uh, who is kind of, you know, a, a hero to a lot of people, especially our audience, um, and gives, gives you kind of, um, lets you see something that you're extremely familiar with in a, in a, in a new way, uh, which I think is where the success of it came from. I mean, the first one we did was with Pierce Brosnan, um, and we just came up with the idea, like, GoldenEye is a huge film, it was coming up to the anniversary, I think, of it, or kind of roughly that year. Um, and we very much thought it was, we didn't think he would do it. <laughs> he seems like he's got other stuff to be getting on with. Um, but I presume he was just bored. Uh, it's, there can't be that much to do when you're just sitting in your house in Hawaii and there's no films being made. So he kind of, he was incredibly um, excited by the idea when we pitched it to him. Um, I don't think he realised quite how long the film was. He said he hadn't seen it since the premiere, basically. Uh, so he kind of realised it's a two and a half hour mammoth thing that he was there by himself talking through. Um, but he was great, you know, and he kind of, he really seemed to enjoy the experience. I think what was really brilliant about that first one was that then for us created the impetus, you know, I think a million odd people watched that across the various YouTube and it got promoted on Twitter and various places. Um, and then it demonstrated the kind of the effectiveness of it. So it helped to bring other people on later. Uh, Stephen Knight did a brilliant one on Peaky Blinders. Um, we obviously talked about Widmull and I. Uh, John Hayden did one not that long ago for Napoleon Dynamite. And the way that we thought about structuring them is all these things are kind of, they're not cult, but they are, they have an inbuilt audience that has seen this thing over and over again, is very familiar with it. Um, I think what you said about the fact that Windmill and I is endlessly rewatchable, it is. Uh, and so having someone then add another layer to it is where that becomes interesting because it kind of creates a new way of viewing yeah. something you're super familiar with. I, I was going to say, I mean, to what extent were uh, people enjoying, you know, Golden and all these things that had formed, you know, re revisiting, as it were, movies that had played a a part in their in their youth or their upbringing or whatever and was but was there a set was there a segment of the audience that was was you know watching with Noel for the first time for example I, I mean there may well have been I don't I, I think it was very much fans um and we had yeah. the we had in the YouTube especially we had the live chat going at the same time we took questions in advance that we could then send to the people who were doing it and you end up with these incredibly insightful questions that I as a kind of casual fan of a lot of this stuff couldn't have asked because these people are so aware. And so they were asking production points and how certain things were done and things you've never heard of, which kind of keyed up really interesting anecdotes and, and, and things from the from the, the stars who are hosting it. Um, but it meant that you end up also having this, because the YouTube live chat is live, people having these conversations with each other about, well, who should be cast as the next Bond or, you know, what, happened, like, what did you think of when you first saw it? Or where were you when you saw Wither for the first time? And I think that was really interesting because that's what created that community aspect to me. Um, you know, we had, the Reddit subgroups for all of these films were inherently big and they were already having talks before the things landed and it created a nice impetus. But I think you really need that baked in audience, like Emily was saying, because they're the ones that give it the head of steam and they're the people for ultimately for whom this stuff is created. Uh, and without them, no culture really has any resonance or relevance. Um, so they were the ones that, that I think created this second layer of interest uh, and conversation underneath the sort of umbrella of, of, of the main person. We've gone into lockdown by mistake, so to speak, as the mm. fans would immediately recognise. Um, thank you, Tom. We will we, we, we'll return to you uh, shortly. Uh, Max, welcome. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and a couple of things I, I wanted to to ask you specific to Secret Cinema. I mean, first of all, um, you know the the, the 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 recent story of Secret Sofa. How, tell us about that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I noticed you had some terrific choices like Grand Budapest Hotel, which are very much the sort of thing that Secret Cinema would do. Um, so it was it seemed true to the brand. So we um, we are part theater, part cinema screening, part rave, and our audiences arrive and leave on mass transport systems. So we're like the full suite of horsemen of the COVID apocalypse. So when um, a year ago the world shut down, we were kind of Sort of paralyzed for about eight weeks just going oh my god literally we're, we're, we're in chains and and our, our instincts are sort of physically congregational rather than distributed and social and and virtual uh although we we we've learned a little bit a little bit about it uh over the last 12 months and the secret sofa came about because um we there was a sort of insight that the week had become completely undifferentiated. So 
So people were in their pajamas at three in the afternoon and drinking warm gin at 9 a.m. And you couldn't tell, you know, when the weekend was about was about to happen. And so so we we cobbled together a series of um, of eight shows. Uh, and, and I mean, it was a sort of living nightmare because we were doing a new show every week that had the same arc as a, as a secret cinema. But which, if you'll permit me, for those who don't know secret cinema, it's a kind of ludicrous conceit where um, we, we, we invite people to, to come to a show, to a physical location in, in character. So it's not promenade theatre and it's not voyeuristic. We, we invite and in large measure receive a huge amount of active participation uh, from our audiences. And they really can change the arc of the narrative of, of, of the show uh, in, in an evening. Uh, and uh, and it's really really fun when when that happens. Albeit when when I describe it to myself, it sounds like a ludicrous thing for a middle aged man like me to be doing. But um, so we have the same arc with these with these secret sofas, which is when we did Grand uh, Hotel. All the ones that we did had been shows. We did Grand Hotel. You know, you got an invitation uh, from Gustav. People spent a week baking cakes and making cocktails and dressing their rooms. And then on the evening of the show at six o'clock, uh, there was a bit of performance. So we cast a couple of actors who in this instance taught people to dance. And that was mediated through Zoom over Facebook. So it was mostly, mostly a Facebook commentary and people posting pictures of themselves and their cakes and so on. And then at 7.30, everyone hit play. And, um, uh, and Tom, our, our audience tend to be sort of ludicrously effervescent fans of the films that they're in. So they, you, you'd hate it. They blab over it like lunatics. Um, and they- No, 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 no. I, I, I've been in it. I mean, I, you know, I'm still, um, recovering is not the word, but um, I, I mean, the, short, the secret cinema Shawshank is one of the great cinematic experiences I've ever had. It's fantastic. So sure, we did Shawshank over the summer and people dressed their, they dressed their living rooms as, as cells and got their partners to take the part of uh, screws and hand out punishment beatings, I think, in some instances. But then, uh, then at the end of the show, we, um, we hosted sort of big Zoom parties and um, uh, where, you know, again, we had some of our wonderful cast would be in character hosting whole rooms and then other people would be in side rooms, you know, having seances or uh, my, my favourite was when we hosted a sort of antique effectively an antique road show people had to run around the house finding something that was precious to them and then pitch it to everybody else in the side rooms and then before they were five people were spotlighted for the whole um for the whole but i mean they were sort of they were sort of ludicrous uh in many respects and joyful and Glor glorious I, I i mean i would say look i mean it it, it what you described that the, the people would go to that effort in lockdown says something really, really terrific about the human spirit. Sure. I, I mean, you know, and I, and I, um, I mean, I, 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 I completely heard what Emily said and I really, I, I, I've become, I've become much more so sort of open to the possibilities afforded by social media. And I've become actually a, a tickety talk star with my daughter um, as of last night. So, which I'll be sending, I'll be putting a link in the sidebar in a moment so everyone can add, add there's, to there's a movie there's a movie feature in this max or is it is it, is it just it's uh, more it's more just personal the, abuse um pixar uh, shorts into a, but in a but in a good way but i do think i mean i'm i'm a hundred percent convinced that people miss this these these congregational cathedrals of storytelling uh, where, whether you're receiving it or uh, you know flat in in serried rows watching the latest bond or whether you're running around like lunatics at a rave or you know or even in fancy dress at one at one of our shows I, I i've I, I mean i've enjoyed the social media events that i've that i've done but mostly they serve to remind me of this kind of visceral need for, for kind of human contact and togetherness, which is sort of unmediated by screens. I mean, it's, it, it, which, which sort of leads me very, uh, very much onto what I was going to ask you next, which is about secret cinema generally, because it's fascinated me for years. And I think 
I've thought about it a lot and it, it seems to me that it's no accident that it, it, it happened and it became such a huge phenomenon at almost exactly the, the same time as broadband and all the digital devices started to drive us towards individualistic consumption of culture. And, um, and there, there was a kind of reflexed uh, response to that, which was no, we do, we, you know, we want more than ever, we want um, an immersive collective experience of culture. And I think, I just want to whether you agree with that, 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 that secret cinema, you know, it was, was and is very much of its time. Wow, that sounds terrible. I hope we're, I hope we're also of the next time as well. No, I mean, no, no. I mean, when I say our time, I mean... We're like, out of time. No, no, forever. You know, I mean... Yeah, in, sure. No, I, I hear you. We take, so we... Um, we digital uh, devices aren't going anywhere, you know, so... Um, we, you, bag you people, either. we bag people's phones when they come to the show. And, yeah. Uh, and, and it has, it's kind of interesting watching people's sort of physical response to their phone being taken away or or, or put put out of reach which is there's a sort of you know there's, there's a, almost a kind of an immediate withdrawal but then people straighten up and um yeah. and and I and mean, I see it with my my kids a lot which is you know with a mobile phone you you're sort of in a pretended way never bored so you can always just look down you know but but at the same time you're you're very seldom looking around and and you, it's very hard to notice things when you're when you're not bored because if you can be engaged with doom scrolling at the kind of at, at, at the first hint of an absence of distraction, it, you never make eye contact with people. This thing that we notice in our shows, which is which is um, when they stand waiting, as they never do because our queuing our queues are so well managed. But just imagine there was a queue at a bar in one of our shows. If you go to a bar now and there's a queue, I mean, what a Actually, can we all take a moment just to reflect on that? <laughs> a moment of silence. Yeah. If you, could get a, if you could go to a bar now, right? Uh, but you know, people people stand. They're all underlit with blue. Yeah. They're never catching anyone's eyes. They're never looking at the bar. People are ordering while still staring down. At our shows, they haven't got their phones, so when they're standing in queues for places, they're forced to look around at one another. They they connect with people, they catch people's eyes. I mean, who knows? They might they might pull, they'll make friends or enemies or get into fights, but but it's but it's a real authentic, visceral, unmediated experience. And I just can't believe that that's ever going to be, you know, unlooked for and unwanted. And 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 it's and it's not it's not really, in my view, effectively substitution of how do you say that word? That there isn't really a substitute for it that's mediated by social media, in my view. It's, it's, I, very, it's very interesting at your events that, that what I've always detected is there is a release of human energy um, to, no. do, to do with the collective experience and the immersive experience in Blade Runner, you know, unforgettable. I, I, I agree. I mean, that's this is the congregate. I mean, you can be at our shows, you can be on a solitary adventure, but the, the moments that everyone remembers are the kind of the congregational moments. They're the, you know, the sort of the, the R's when the curtain goes up or when, you know, when 007 falls out of the helicopter and all the money is scattered over Casino Royale or when the X-Wing flies overhead or, or when, you know, we all participate in some ludicrous pretense of starting a revolution to overthrow the, as you said, or just dance in the rain with umbrellas. I mean, these are, yeah. these are, these are properly, you know, we are, it's, 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 it's like a sort of, um, it's a very, it's a very thin church. Tears in rain. It's, it's, no, it's wonderful. Um, I, 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 I want to come to one or two people, the chat has been uh, fizzing away. Um, and I wondered if I might come to Indra um, uh, Diamandis, I think it's, it's uh, forgive me if I've, pronounce that incorrectly. Um, Indra, are you there? Not sure if you're... Yes, yes, I'm here. Hi, hi. Um, can Hello. We see... Hi, uh, thank you so much for joining. Um, you made a very good point about um, the, 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 the function of this in maintaining uh, mental health during lockdown, and I, I wondered if you might elaborate on that. Um, 
Well, the reason why I said that is because uh, I've, I've, I'm uh, somebody who has taken part in a lot of Emily's watch-alongs. And Definitely. hello, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, and um, yeah, I think in terms of so the watch-alongs that Emily has done, they've uh, they have brought people together, even though they're not physically in the room. They brought a lot of um, people together just through the hashtag and through watching the episodes because even when like I've even when I've sent even when I've made some tweets regarding the episodes I've noticed some fat that fans have actually liked my tweets and they've retweeted them and they and they've replied to me and you know I've actually made some new online friends as well throughout it and I do believe that in in these times especially that social media is actually good at sort of helping people to connect with each other because we are still in these times at the moment which can be very very lonely because we there are restrictions but you know I do um, believe social media is powerful for you know helping people's mental health helping people to speak to each other I, I do really believe that Yes, it gets a, it's it, it's had a bad rap, but actually, it's probably also there's there's, uh, there's huge love in the chat for your Thunderbirds background, oh, and, thank and, you. and rightly so, if I may thank say you. so, on a personal note. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, can we uh, can we come now to Marianne Brandley, um, who was uh, talking about um, just what it was like to go to one of the um, secret cinema experiences I just wondered if you could you could talk about that a little, bit, a little bit yeah so it was I think it was in Canada waters the Canary Wharf and you get off the tube and everyone's dressed up and everyone's walking around in in character so you don't know if they're actually a character or if they're just a, a regular attendee um, and it really is like an immersive experience you walk in and there was the Bedouin there there was all the different um, you know the characters from uh, Star Wars and then you had the different food and drinks and walking around it was it was yeah it was like kind of being at a little festival um, and then you sat in and watched the movie and there was fighting during the movie so it was kind of cutting across while the movie was going on so it was just so much fun it was just a real joyful experience it was really fun. And have you what what is it what have your cultural habits been uh, like during lockdown have they have you have you done any of these uh, watch alongs or or listen alongs? I haven't, not really, no. I Mostly being like Zoom calls or quizzes with friends and family, but not really. No, but I mean, that's a similar, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's a similar, fun it's a similar function, isn't it? Of, of, of um, using using um, digital technology for togetherness. Yeah, I think I'm starting to move to phone as a bit of a, um, a, a change up. So actually not being on a camera screen, but actually talking old school on a phone. Uh, <laughs> so that feels a bit re re retro. But we can't live by Zoom alone, it's true, as much as we, though God knows we try. Um, uh, uh, can, I, can I come now to Will, thank you very much. Can we now come to Will Warren, uh, if Will's there? Um, Hello. Will, hi, thanks so much for joining us. Now, you're, you're the um, co-founder of the Track by Track podcast, which I think is a a sort of uh, another you know gem of of, of this of this of this um of, of, of this of this crown um can you uh, can you talk about what how how that worked and how 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 you how you came to sort of select what you what you were offering to your punters yeah sure thing i mean it was dan and i dan who's my podcasting partner we'd often talked about we'd love to do like a live version of the podcast that we do which is Every week we talk through a pop music album, uh, track by track, um, which has been for a couple of years now, great fun, really, um, really interactive. And I think lockdown, when it started last year, gave us an opportunity um, to, to do something with that. We thought about how we, there were no gigs anymore. Uh, and we'd often together go to gigs and, and enjoy that kind of shared music experience. Uh, with, and we also thought about the number of artists that are potentially more available than they were before. There might be an opportunity to connect, to join forces. Uh, so we, we reached out to a load of artists that we uh, had previously covered on the podcast and a few that we had yet to do, um, thinking, let's just ask the question and see. And lo and behold, almost everyone that we reached out to at some point over the months 
of last year got back to us uh, and wanted to take part in a tweet along as a live version of the podcast that we do. And uh, they became over, over time more and more popular, more and more people joining in. And it was just, again, similar to what other people so far have, have, have also called out, the shared experience of enjoying uh, an album uh, from beginning to end, an episode of Doctor Who, a film, um, it really felt felt like you were bringing people together at a time when we couldn't do it physically, so we couldn't go to gigs. And to have that artist with you, um, adding extra, extra insights and comments and responding to fans uh, in a way that maybe they wouldn't normally do. And Dan is, Dan is on this call as well today, and my memory is very patchy, but Dan just... Remind me some of the people, because I think we started off with Banana Rama, which is uh, an act we've covered before. But who else? Who else was? Who else did we do? Uh, we did. Uh, so we had Melanie C, who did one for her solo work in the Spice Girls, uh, the B52s, Darren Hayes, uh, New Order, Blondie. Um, yeah, lots of lots of our, our musical heroes, which you know it was great to share that experience with listeners and and people who never heard the podcast before, but were fans of the bands. But actually, to be listening to an album with Blondie or the B-52s and know they were listening to it at the same time and sharing their thoughts with us and hearing our thoughts is just a mind-blowing experience. Uh, can, can I ask you both? Was the um, was was the experience you were detecting from the people that were joining in one of of, of looking for consolation in things that were familiar um, and things that they loved and wanted to talk about? Or, or, or was it just simply um, a, a reconfiguration of the normal cultural experience or a bit of both? I think a bit of both, but I also think what's great about doing it with an album is that, because um, you know, the, the watch-alongs are fantastic, but watching something uh, can generally be a shared experience, having someone around to watch a series together or going to the cinema and talking about it afterwards. But I think it's even more of a rarity to actually sit down with someone in real life and play an album together. So that in itself became just uh, almost a brand new concept, I suppose. Um, and also li listening to an album in full nowadays, such a rare thing because we, you know, it's more about playlists, I think, for a lot of people than albums. Very, album than, very uh, much so. And our podcast is, is about the celebration of the album as a format and the start to finish and why that last song is the last song. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, a bit of familiarity, but a bit a bit of actually, this might be the first time you've ever listened to this album with anyone else. And and it's, a, it's a very interesting point, Will, that, 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 that sort of the rediscovery of the album as album, because we, we've tended to, in, you know, they've more and more there now, you know, as Dan was saying, they'd be disaggregated in playlists. But the idea of actually listening to parallel lines from beginning to end or whatever it might be, it, it is... Is something that that uh, that people haven't done for a while. Yeah, absolutely, and it feels like it's continued. I mean, Tim Burgess is had having huge success still with doing that, and he's found you know as well thousands of people who are enjoying kind of rediscovering that. I think it's so easy. Um, I was guilty of doing it myself on Spotify this morning. New Music Friday. You kind of scan really quickly lots of tracks. Whereas you enjoy an album from beginning to end and you can really appreciate each track. Uh, and we've come to appreciate, not just through the tweet alongs, but through doing the podcast, the joy of an album and maybe tracks that don't jump out because they're not as instant as a single, but in the context of a whole album, just feels uh, really smooth and feels really comfortable in that. That, 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 that's, I mean, I think that's very much the heart of it. Um, could, could I come, uh, thank you very much. Can, could I come to Dominica Flejar? Um, Dominica, you had your hand up, so I didn't- Yeah, know. I do, hello. Hi, how are you? Uh, Great. Nice to see you. Uh, uh, tell, tell us what point you wanted to make. Welcome to the um, Yeah, um, I, um, I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to talk about something that I, like I'm particularly passionate about and that's been proven quite difficult in a online space is theater and um, I've recently written quite a lengthy piece for my master's project for, about how theater is functioning in this online space when there is no 
actual theatre, like theatres are closed, um, all over the world. And it's been proven more and more difficult. And there's been some exciting opportunities, like there were girls in New Zealand, they made some amazing show about like lockdown experience in New Zealand, and they even included Boris Johnson in it, and his nurse Jenny from New Zealand. Um, but all in all, I think it highlighted one issue that is very important. It's how outdated copyrights are, especially in theatre. I had friends that made like a reading of Hamilton that had been copyrighted, which is kind of absurd when you think of it, because there is literally no harm to the creative team behind Hamilton done from a bunch of teenagers reading the material on Zoom. Um, there's no one thinking, oh, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to see the West End or Broadway show now because, you know, my 15-year-old friend read, like, no, no one thinks that way. And um, another thing is certain stuff in theater, it is simply impossible for it to work online, such as um, like Edinburgh Fringe, because most people except people who actually had shows in Edinburgh Fringe. They don't go there to see any particular show. They go there for the experience, experience of unity and sort of connecting with other people who have the same passion. And they try to move the festival online and it didn't work. I mean, the, the, the channel on YouTube has like 2000 subscription or something. It, it, it's been a huge failure um, compared to what it is live. And uh, yeah, that's, this is my main, main point. I think. Interesting how, how not everything travels that way. It's a, it's a fascinating distinction. Um, thank you very much for, for that contribution. Um, um, can, can I come to, come to Lucy Huberman now, who, uh, if, if, you, if you come to Tortoise Thinkings, you'll know is a, is, a, is, is a fantastic force in the Tortoise family. And, <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, well, and I should say, um, uh, sort of nonchalantly revealed in the um, in in the chat just now that she made a film with the Style Council and Lucy, I can't, you know, we can't let that pass. You, you know, we need to know. Come on, you know, what's the what's the story and how did it how did it arise again recently as a as a as an issue in your life? Yeah, well, it was a spectacular flop with the fans when it came out because um, it was far too clever. For its own good, written by Paul Weller and um, his friend at the Enemy, Paolo Hewitt. And as a producer, it was a very difficult challenge because we weren't allowed to change one word of the script. So normally, as a producer, you can say to them, "This doesn't work. This doesn't work. This is a load of rubbish. No one will understand this." Or whatever. But we weren't allowed. <laughs> we weren't allowed. And. Um, I think I was asked to produce it because I produced um, a tour video of the Red Wedge tour, which was the year before. And I didn't come from show business. I didn't come for the, from the record industry. And Paul Weller was going through a bit of a quiet phase trying to decide what to do. And the record company, I think, wanted him to be able to do something he wanted to do. So we made a film called Jerusalem. I, I, I'm not going to talk about it because you'll have to, you know, look back at the watch party on Twitter if you want any answers at all. But um, the fans didn't like it at the time and Paul used it as a pre-show tool instead of an intro act. And it was, I think, in an election year and anyway, nobody liked it. But over the years, it's found a, I thought it was a kind of thing that might turn up in a master's thesis one day, but it has sort of acquired a bit of a fan cult following and somebody in particular who looks after Paul's archive unofficially, I think was working with Tim Burgess on, on, on doing some listening parties for other albums. And when it came to this period, they didn't want to do the album, which was The Cost of Loving, which also wasn't you know, regarded as their, it had that orange cover, it was known as the orange album. It wasn't considered one of their best, but, you know, the singles that were released from it that I produced videos for were on every, in those days when train platforms had video, video screens and you could watch promo videos, it was absolutely everywhere. So I had to do a watch party, which gave me a taste of my own medicine. I had um, Steve White, the drummer, and um, I tried to, I was in touch with lots of the actors and people. Uh, sadly, Mick Talbot wouldn't do it and Paul never does them. 
but other, other people did do it. And it gave me a taste of my own medicine because I'd been doing some oral history interviews with people, mm. asking them to remember stuff 30 years ago, and they were giving me a lot of grief. And then I was asked to produce memories, but luckily I took loads of shots myself of the film. So I had previously unseen, unpublished amateur <laughs> photographs that everybody loved. And did it make more sense, um, you know, now than then as, as a kind of artifact of the uh, part of the forward okay. journey? Yeah, I think I think some people have had, you know, they've all grown up by 30 years. They've had some time to think about it. There were a couple of really good articles about it um, in the NME that were spot on at the time, obviously by Stuart Cosgrove, who understand, understood things. Yeah. They were very mid 80s sort of journey through Thatcher's England um, theme. Um, and even I look back at some of the press and I've read some of the subsequent in interviews with Paul and, and looked at their, their references. I mean, they didn't talk to us about, uh, you know, I didn't sit down with Paul and have endless debate about, you know, the meaning of every word, but actually it's all laden with, you know, references of things that Mick and Paul kept in their attics and, and talked about at length. Um, I, was, I mean, I was, I was still with the style councillors that they, they make a lot more sense now than they did <laughs> at the time because they they were you know his gap year from from being punk and new new wave and it, it was his his way of, of 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 discovering his own identity but at the time a lot of people were very hostile to it they didn't like the fact that he changed so quickly and so much and that's carried on through the various gear changes that he's had throughout his career and it, i haven't been a kind of fangirl all along i but um, I was approached, you know, been approached now by two academics writing about him. So I've had to kind of like think a bit about it. And um, yeah, I keep wanting that other academic to come on with me to do another one because he's actually thought about it even more. But I think what I just think is um, he's Paul's an artist, you know, he goes with his influences and what moves him and he changes. And that is not a regular pop star. No, he certainly isn't. He's an artist, yeah. Wonderful to have to have to have been there and, and to be able to go back and, and and review it though. Thank you, Lucy. Um, could we go to Agetia, who's had her hand up, I think, um, all the way through um, uh, the last conversation? And uh, um, so basically, Blair, um, um, there I am misgendering you. My apologies. <laughs> yeah. Um, start. Um, fire. So, welcome to the conversation. We can't see you. I think. Is it, um, um, yeah. I don't, I, I don't really uh, like videos, so I'm not going to... Okay. Yeah. But it's a question to Emily. Uh, like, when will... Oh, sorry, not a question, I think. Oh, so when... Um, thing, yeah. When is she doing the lock? When is she planning... Sorry. Is she planning to um, do a double lockdown in the future, and does she recommend any lock, people who do dot two lockdown things, like watch along things uh, for me? Thank you very much. Uh, so Emily, are, are you planning to do more or another, are there other parallel examples of, of Doctor Who um, uh, watch alongs that, 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 that could be watched? Well, I'm very conscious of the fact that what we've done so far has been really specific to lockdown. So we've kind of had three seasons of Doctor Who lockdown in parallel with each of the three national lockdowns that we've had. Um, so we have got uh, our last one coming up at the weekend as we're starting to have restrictions slowly lifting. Um, but I do think... So on the one hand, it is something that has been for this period of lockdown and the pandemic. But I also do think we've tapped into something with the tweet alongs that could potentially happen in the future. Um, you can bring people together for Christmas special episodes of Doctor Who, for example, or, or the odd one here and there. I, I don't think it'll ever quite be the same and quite as intense as it has been for the last year or so. But I do think that people have really been able to be creative and tap into new ways of bringing fan bases and communities together. So it might, it's interesting, Emily, because that, that was, uh, time is sort of running out, but I, I did want to ask uh, you and, and Max and, and, um, uh, and, 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 and Tom also, um, you, you know, what, whether, whether, how much of this will survive. And, and so you do think some of this 
it, these aren't just emergency measures. They are they are um, a new form of experience that might find a place in the post post pandemic world. I think so. I think they were initially emergency measures when we were like, ah, what do we do? <laughs> How do we come together? And it was it was our only means um, using digital and the internet to, to bring people together. As I said earlier, I don't think that um, real interactions are ever going to get completely replaced by by online. We've I think we've realised through lockdown that we need those real world interactions so much as a, as a human race. But I do think that there are elements of what people have been doing in lockdown through these creative watch alongs and creating new content and, and parties online and Zoom and what have you that I do think will be used as a resource in the future. Um, not, not in the same way and not at the same level of intensity, but I, I just think it's inevitable that it will be part of our culture moving forward. And I'd be I'd be delinquent in my journalistic capacity if I didn't. Um, I, uh, I I'm I, I'm not suggesting you have any privileged information, information about this, but who who are you finding your readers are backing as uh, the next doctor? Oh gosh, <laughs> almost an impossible question to answer. Um, so many names get touted around. Alan Davies always gets mentioned, okay. um, but I I don't think it would be him. Um, I, I honestly can't really can't really say because there are basically anyone, any actor that uh, Doctor Who fan sees wearing a fancy coat or a fancy hat or a fancy scarf will get touted as the next Doctor because <laughs> yeah. they look suitably Doctorish. Um, and it's not something that, as the official magazine that I work for, it's not something that we tend to speculate on. Dangerous, um, incredibly dangerous uh, yeah. territory I'm on here, I know. It's, it's uh, <laughs> like the next Bond or, you know. Yeah. Uh, could well. be anyone, could be it's anyone significantly more important than the next Archbishop of Canterbury but um but yeah <laughs> very deftly evaded I had to ask um uh, Tom you know you're you're you know you work for an incredibly successful um magazine um as you know when we come out of lockdown that it will resume uh, you know operations um of the sort that we're, we're used to and enjoying um do you think this kind of um Thing will carry on being part of the, the Squire product. I mean, is it is it here to stay, or was it just a kind of um, uh, uh, you know a fire a, 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 a kind of fire fire escape? I'd, I'd like it to. I think um, well, I think the the stuff that I see continuing, and this is not just for us, but in general, is I think the stuff that shifts the conversation forward and does something new. A lot of the things that I've tried to engage with that are just facsimiles of other ways of consuming culture. Um, I find it like fallen really flat throughout the pandemic. I really struggle to watch live stream theatre because you kind of there, there's something inherently missing. It reminds you of that. And I find the same thing with a lot of live gigs. Kind of they they don't for me feel that um, they just remind me of what's not there. Whereas I think stuff like the album projects is bri brilliant and the watch alongs are interesting because they're not something that we had before in the, in the same way. They're they're new and they're different. And so that's what I think you'll see continuing. Um, Whereas obviously the, the, the other stuff kind of once you can get a gig again, there's not a huge amount of point sitting in your living room and watching one in the same way. So we definitely want to continue them and we want to look at other stuff that we can do that's that's along the same lines. I think ultimately when you can what the video format and the social format lets you do is, is reach an audience that's much larger and allow that audience to meet someone who they couldn't otherwise get access to. I mean, we do an annual um, live event called Esquire Townhouse, which went fully digital last year. But it's the same thing, you know, we'll talk to brilliant directors or musicians and stuff, and they'll, it's an interview series and there's 100 people in the room, but there's only 100 people in the room. Why shouldn't there be a million people watching it at the same time? And so anything that kind of bridges that gap, I think, is the stuff that, that is exciting and will continue. Um, whereas, yes, I mean, we definitely want to move more of them we want to do other stuff i mean the album stuff i think is fascinating i think there's interesting stuff that can be done around you know um all kinds of cultural mediums you know what like book readings remain huge way in normal times there's no reason that couldn't shift to an online format and, and indeed they do so yeah we definitely want to look at how how we do other stuff um and we've got a big list of kind of people we want to speak to so yeah fingers so crossed it wasn't just a parachute that's really it's very interesting that you see it surviving M max um we're drawing to drawing to a close, but I, I I do want to ask you, you know, obviously for you, I assume 21st of June is that is a big date um, or, or maybe even, uh, 
you know, May the 17th, you, you can start providing uh, socially distanced um, events. Um, what, what's, what's the immediate future for, for Secret Cinema? So we've got a show, um, uh, we've got Dirty Dancing on sale. This is that summer. Walthamstow? Is that the, the, the Walthamstow? I, well, I, can't, I, I can't, I, I we, we haven't decided upon a location. Of course, of course. It's, it's, Sorry, it's a reasonably passionate exchange of views. <laughs> From the good burgers of E17, <laughs> about whether or not we should put it in Walthamstow. But I tell you this, I was really interested in what Tom, Tom was saying. So we, now that we know that we can provoke hilarious behaviour in character over Zoom, mediated by our actors, that's going to be a part of our shows from now on because our shows work best when people have come to terms to some, you know functional degree with the character that we're giving them and that they've learned some rules of engagement about the world that they're going into so so we i mean this has been a really valuable experience for us so all our shows now will have a will have a, a rich much richer than they had before and and live as well as recorded digital experience at the at the front end so that we can really rev the lunacy up by the time that they get to the uh, gates so actually, uh, Secret Sofa is now going to be the gateway drug to Secret For Cinema. Sure. This, is, this is very exciting. So, so you know, uh, within every cloud, there is a silver lining, uh, even a global pandemic. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it's, it, but I, but I, I'm interested in what you, what, I mean, do you, do you take the temperature and, and think that the appetite will be even greater um, or will people be cautious as they come back um, so, out of lockdown? So we, so, so we were, we had our ticket, we had tickets on sale that were trickling, trickling along, uh, and sales doubled on Monday. They doubled again on Tuesday. They doubled again on Wednesday. So I mean, it feels like everyone. I mean, you know, and who knows? There are so many bumps in the road and kinks in the stream, but but it does feel that. There's, there's, there's been a sort of coiled up potential energy. And, um, and, and now that people have been given permission to look forward to summer, uh, it, it, feels like, it feels like people are really, really motivated to fill their afternoons and their days with, you know, connected experiences, whether, well, physically connected experiences. I think you're right. Uh, I, I, very sadly, we're drawing to a close. But I think um, I've enjoyed this uh, hour immensely and I'm grateful to everyone who came along. And what it's absolutely driven home to me is that um, the, the, the desire for people to come together, even if they're in, in separate rooms, um, to watch things together, to enjoy culture together has not been dimmed in the slightest of anything. It's been amplified and that we will all meet again outside <laughs> our hutches uh, in in, in 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 creative venues and enjoy things but also we'll we, we won't ditch the what we've learned in lockdown and the, these rather amazingly uh innovative forms we've heard about in the last hour will continue and to and they will be supplementary complementary to the the um the the older um traditional systems of consumption so huge thanks to to emily to Tom and to Max for joining in. Thanks to you for, 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 for being with us uh, and to Santander as of being our partners. The next Creative Sense Maker Live will be on Friday, March the 26th, and it will be an uh, unabashed celebration of all things 90s. So don't look back in anger until then, and thank you all very much. Uh, enjoy your afternoon.